Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, Pig Sloppin', in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And hello, genies, and welcome to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com, where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, and uh, before I tell you what we got lined up for you this week, I want to welcome another fine radio station to our growing list of affiliates, KRCN, Bloomberg Radio 1060 in Denver, Colorado. We're very pleased to be a part of Ron Kreider's weekend lineup. We've got some great news and outstanding guests today. The first, coming in about 10 minutes, is a man who had his father for quite some time but never got much out of him concerning his experiences in World War II. It wasn't until his father was gone that he got on the trail and flushed out some amazing information from his father's surviving colleagues from all around the country. Serious stuff and seriously funny stuff. You'll want to hear how he did it and hear about the only book he's ever written in his life as a result. It's something any of us could do if we really wanted to. And you're going to want to hear some of his father's tales as well. Then later in the show, have you ever heard of genealogical cruises? No? Well, don't feel bad. I hadn't either. Thomas McEntee will be here to tell us all about them, where they go, what you do, and how to find one that might suit you. As I plot my next vacation, I know I'll be taking a close look at this. Our poll for this past week was on ancestors with stories that are too hard to believe. We asked, do you have an ancestor whose story is so amazing you wonder if it could really be true? And 63% said yes. Darlene in Decatur, Alabama, listening on WEKI, dropped me an email describing her ancestor's story. Fisher, my great-grandfather was courting my great-grandmother. Coming to her house for a date in the early 1900s with a horse and buggy, the horse would not stop. Great-grandfather went right past her home, yelling, Whoa! The route through town was very familiar to the horse, and it circled around three times before great-grandfather was finally able to get the horse under control. I think it was tired. As you can imagine, he and my future great-grandmother decided it probably wasn't best to go on their date at the mercy of this particular horse. Well, thanks for that story, Darlene. And if you have a tale you'd like to share, you can do as Darlene did and drop me an email at fisher at extremegenes.com or call our toll-free find line at 1-234-56-GENES. That's G-E-N-E-S. Record your story, your comment, or question, and you might end up on the show. And, of course, you can always Facebook us as well at facebook.com slash extremegenes. This week's poll asks... Have you ever discovered that a close friend was also a relative? Yes or no? Cast your vote at ExtremeGenes.com. Here is this week's family histoire news from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. In Germany, a bottle containing a message, an envelope, and stamps was thrown into the Baltic Sea in 1913, and it has found its way back to the family of the man who cast his thoughts on and into the water. Now picture this. Angela Erdman of Hamburg gets a knock on her door from a genealogist who tracked her down to inform her he was delivering a message sent flying into the sea by her late grandfather in 1913. How crazy would that be? Her grandfather, Richard Plotz, died six years before she was born back in the 1940s. At the time of the bottle-throwing incident, Richard was 20 years old and believed to have been on a hike with a nature appreciation group. A lot of the note written on a postcard was no longer legible, though it's hoped it can be deciphered at some point with a little help from science. The parts that could be read indicated that Plotz wanted the finder of the note to send it on to his home address. He even included a couple of stamps to cover the cost. I doubt he could have imagined it would have come home 101 years later to a granddaughter he never knew. 
The bottle was pulled in with a haul of fish by a fisherman and will be displayed in Hamburg at a maritime museum. You can't make things up like this. A search has begun as a result of the discovery of photographs of some 100 sketches taken of American soldiers in Holland in February of 1945. Elizabeth Black was a Red Cross worker and sketched over 1,000 images. She then had her subjects write something to her in a special book. Near the end of the time that she was doing this work, she began taking photos of her sketches before giving the originals to the soldiers. Ms. Black died years ago, but those photos were found in a military footlocker that recently was sent on to one of her sons in Memphis, Tennessee. The roughly 100 photos became a cause for Elizabeth's son, and he has since gone about trying to track down the men or their descendants. So far, 31 of the 100 images have found their way back to the families. The phone calls have produced a lot of tears of joy, and Pittsburgh television station KQED has produced a 50-minute documentary to try to help find the families that go with the remaining pictures. The documentary will be on PBS stations throughout the country sometime in May. It's a great story with many happy endings and hopefully many, many more. Find the link and read all the details at ExtremeGenes.com. Next, a project has begun to digitize thousands of historic documents housed at the Vatican Library. The documents date from the origins of the Catholic Church all the way to the 20th century and will eventually be online. The digital project will cover about one and a half million pages from the library's manuscript collection. It's estimated that this initial phase will take four years to complete. The library itself dates back to the 1300s and houses some 41 million pages and 82,000 items. So this is just a starting point. When the project is completed, it is anticipated that a new phase will begin to digitize everything in the Vatican Library's collection. To remember the commencement of the Civil War in April 1861, Ancestry.com's Fold 3 is inviting genies everywhere to sift through all records in their Civil War collection. Go to go.fold3.com slash Civil War for free from now through the end of the month. This includes military records, personal accounts, and historic writings, soldier service records, pension index cards, widow's pension files, Navy survivor certificates, Army registers, and a whole lot more. There are also photographs, original war maps, court investigations, slave records, all kinds of great stuff. That's free now through the end of April at go.fold3.com slash Civil War. Hey, just a reminder, you can catch up on all our previous Extreme Genes shows by downloading our podcasts. Just search Extreme Genes iHeart or Extreme Genes iTunes and subscribe to the show. And coming up in five minutes, you'll meet a man who wanted to find out what his father didn't or wouldn't tell him when he was alive. His experiences as a member of a tank battalion in World War II. He went to great lengths but came out with great success. You'll enjoy what John Mitzel has to tell you about the 781st Tank Battalion next on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at TMCPlace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, TMCPlace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. TMCPlace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call TMCPlace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project. Or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. You know, when it comes to family history, there's nothing quite like the thrill of the hunt and the excitement generated by every new discovery. Who were your immigrant ancestors? What ship did they come over on? Why did they come when they did? Did they participate in any military campaigns that took place in their day? What personal challenges did your forefathers and mothers endure? Heritage Consulting, Genealogy Research Services can get you the answers to many of these questions and more. They've been providing professional research and consultation services since 1970. 
1178. Call toll free 1-877-537-2000 to speak directly to a professional family history researcher. Heritage Consulting can research, collect, analyze, and interpret the countless documents your ancestors generated throughout their lives and present the findings to you in an attractive book or in an electronic format. The cost? Far less than you'd expect for far more than you can imagine. 877-537-2000 or go to heritageconsulting.com. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with my special guest from New Hampshire, John Mitzel. How are you, John? I'm very fine, Scott. Thank you for having me. John has done what many of us have done, and that is had a passion to know more about his family and uh, went about discovering his dad's service in World War II, and the result has been a fabulous book that has done so much for so many other families who were tied to the same unit your dad was in. John, let's just start at the beginning. How'd you get this interest? Well, what happened was when I was 12 years old, I like the biblical quote, when I was a child, I talked as a child, and I spoke and I thought as a child. And I asked my dad, what did you do in the war, Dad, like a child? It was like, you know, how many guys did you shoot? Did you kill anybody? Right. Did you see any blood? And naturally enough, not much came out of that conversation, and it kind of lay dormant for 40 years until... One day, for Father's Day, I got my dad's, uh, I guess you'd call it his special box. And, you know, most of us have a special box where we keep all of our special stuff in it. And my dad had passed away, and the box finally got its way into my possession. And I opened it up, and there was dog tags and ribbons and medals. And, you know, it kind of hit me as like, what did you do, Dad? But wow. I couldn't ask, you know, he, Dad was gone. So I started just digging into what he did and got a bunch of facts, but still I was very unsatisfied. I hadn't found the answer to what did you do, Dad, and how did you feel? And so at that point I kept getting more information, uh, more facts. I went to the National Archives to get facts about him, about what he did with the 781st Tank Battalion. And at first, you know, Scott, it's like, uh, the 781st Tank Battalion doesn't sound too impressive. You know, it's, it must be like one of 780 other ones. <laughs> it sounds impressive yeah. to me. I mean, I, I think all the World War II people just, uh, they leave me a little speechless with what they accomplished. It, it absolutely, you're absolutely right. And the, and the really uh, interesting part of it is almost to a person, they really don't, they won't volunteer it. They won't brag. They won't talk about it. So you have to get it out of them. But once you show a really genuine interest, I found probably about at least a dozen people who were with my father's outfit, started to interview them and talk to them and became friends with a couple of them and asked them, not what did you do, but how did you feel? Right. That's a great feel? question. Right. Because to be human is to feel. And I wanted to gain understanding of my dad through these other men. And it's like, did you feel fear? Were you cold? What did you think about the food? How did you feel when you had to actually kill somebody? Well, how did you deal with it? What happened when your friends were killed? Um, All great questions. And uh, thank you. The other thing is, like, how did you feel when you had to get up in, in the morning and get into a tank that you knew was deficient and could not stand up against the equal number in the Germans, that, that you could barely scratch their paint, but they could kill you with one shot? Uh, I got some extraordinary answers and some wonderful stories and some horrifying stories. Tell us one that sticks out in your mind. Yeah, some of these stories come to mind. Are, but one of the funny ones is that, you know, if you give a bunch of 19-year-olds a tank and leave them with, you know, <laughs> little, little supervision, one of the companies in the 781st was formed by basically, uh, it was all the refuse of the other three. And they basically, they were F Troop, and they knew it, and they were proud of it. And when all of the companies went to the firing range to uh, qualify on shooting their rifles, the men in D Company missed the targets on purpose. They knew how to shoot. They were very accurate. But they just chose to get zeros on their scores just to thumb their nose at the government. You know? That's funny. Um, uh, they went off uh, when they were in Germany as part of the occupation forces. These 19-year-olds with their tank, well, one day were sitting across the street from a bank and kind of 
decided that I wonder if our cannon will shoot a hole in the vault. Oh. And then it did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kids with tanks, what a great idea. Yeah, right. Kids with tanks. And and so these these guys decided that you know we we've defeated Germany so the the Reich mark was going to be a defunct currency. So it wouldn't it be fun to have some bags of money and they robbed the bank and they loaded up a truck that they had stolen from the 101st Airborne and they had literally just bags and bags and bags of money <laughs> and were playing with it. Sure. And much to their surprise, a little later on, they found out that the occupation forces decided that the Reich mark was going to be kept. Uh oh. And these guys, they were they were sitting on bags of money as cushions. They had a truck full of money. They didn't know how to get rid of it. They were scared that someone was going to actually come and find them. And so they decided the best way out was to spend it. So they would have kegs of beer brought for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> um, the, the D Company, was they were just an incredibly colorful group of guys. Uh, now tell me, John, do you think your father ever would have revealed any of this stuff had he lived to tell it? You know, if, if I think he would have had, had I had the, um, you know, I guess I, the foresight or if he was still around to ask the questions in the way I posed them later on. You know, to, uh, to talk to somebody as an adult, to give you an example, Scott, one of the uh, folks that I spoke with, he passed away before the book came out, and I sent the book as promised to his wife. And she wrote me a letter and said, John, you must have contacted him on a level that even I never could have because he told you stories that I didn't even know. Well, don't you think and, that was because you were the son of a colleague? Yeah, I think so. Uh, one of the most uh, the proudest day of my life of the, it was amazing is the one of the last surviving officers of the 781st one day made me an honorary member of the 781st. And I'll tell you, I was... I, was, I, I walk on air when I talk about that. that is, I bet you do. I bet it brings tears to your eyes. It's a wonderful thing. And when all is said and done, I took all of these stories and all these facts and all the humanity and rolled it all together, and I, be, I was pretty evangelical that this, this was a story that had to be told. The 781st made a tremendous contribution to winning World War II, and nobody knew about them. And so got the book out, and... Uh, having a book is neat, you know, when you saw I'm an author, that's kind of cool. I have a bunch of new friends that I'm, you know, unfortunately I'm losing them all too quickly. But I have, after all is said and done, I have an understanding of the war in France and the 781st. But most of all, I have an understanding of my dad. That's right. Um, and and that's, the, that's the whole point of all this, isn't it? It's where it began and still where it ends. The book is called Duty Before Self, the story of the 781st Tank Battalion in World War II. It's from Schiffer Publishing. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's by John Mitzel, and that's who we're talking to right now. John, this is a a fabulous story. What did you come away with from this, though, that you felt still haunts the men? Oh, the haunting is individual. Some of them remember um, awful, horrifying stories, and others remember friends who have passed. Nobody talks about it, volunteers, and I think that's the, the, the haunting part about it is I think they all wanted World War II to get over so they could just go back and be themselves, and that's what all of them did. The people that I talked to were a furniture salesman, an insurance broker, you know, a meter reader, an usher, a, a bunch of students, and they couldn't get out of there fast enough, and when they got out of the war, they just went back to being the, the meter reader and the furniture salesman and the gas station attendant and, and got on with their lives. It was an amazing, amazing thing. You know, the biggest thing I can take away and, and to perhaps give to your audience is I, I would urge them all to ask their parents and grandparents, uncles, friends, anybody who was a veteran, and discover their stories and document them before they can take them to a place where we can't get them. And be sure to ask, you know, how did you feel to to these people? Because you might discover a hero there. I did. Well, that certainly seems like the key to getting them to open up a little bit. Whereas if you just ask, what did you do? You might not get that kind of response at that level. Yeah, it's it's important to to get to the humanity of it. It's you know these were just ordinary people that came from you know an ordinary walk of life. 
that became heroes. And the story in the in the book, some of the stories are, are just heroic episodes. Uh, there's some funny stuff, and there's some just heroism that is beyond belief, where you're pulling a friend out of a burning tank. Did they stay in touch uh, with each other, or did they just as much feel like, I just as soon forget the whole thing? I think, you know what's interesting, I think it's like the 80-20 rule, is I think 80% of them just went back to oblivion. Maybe 20% of them went to the reunions and stayed in touch as friends and would talk about it. And I was that's how I was fortunate enough to get in touch with a, with a fair amount of them is um, I was able to get their last reunion roster and go from there. Boy, what a great lesson, though, and how to trace down your family history and expand it, because we are not islands as individuals. And your dad fought in World War II, but he didn't fight alone. And the stories involving him involved many other people, not only his colleagues, but others in the larger military scheme of thing, the enemy, the circumstance, the weather, all of these things. And what a fascinating thing you've done. So congratulations, John. Well, thank you very much. The book is Duty Before Self, the story of the 781st Tank Battalion in World War II. It's available on Amazon.com. Your first book, John? First book. Is there going to be another? Well, we're, don't, I don't want to jinx it, but one of the stories that came out of this book, and we're researching it now to uh, expand upon it. So um, hopefully within a year or so we'll see it. John Mitzel, thanks so much for your time. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me on. I love that. Kids with tanks. And coming up next, something I'd never heard of before, maybe you have, it's genealogical cruises. Thomas McEntee joins us to tell us all about how you can go cruising and enjoy some research information at the same time. It's coming up next on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. What's in your family's old trunk? Antique photos? Cassette recordings? Wire recordings? Old records? Home movies? Videos from the 80s and 90s? Do you hear them and see them again? Often restored to unbelievably realistic colors, you need to take them all to the Multimedia Center. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717. Or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Got a brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson, by calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. With over 35 years of research experience, visit heritageconsulting.com. Welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here. I'm talking to Thomas McEntee. Thomas is the founder of High Definition Genealogy. He has been in the industry for many moons, shall we say, Tom. That's and- correct. Yeah. yeah, I've actually been as a professional in the genealogy field for about five years now. And you're a New Yorker who lives in Chicago, which is hard for any New Yorker ever to understand. Actually, I love I love Chicago. <laughs> Chicago is a collection of 73 neighborhoods. It's more manageable than New York, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think you might be right about that. Yes. What I'm excited about, though, is you've got these genealogy cruises that are going on. you got to tell us what that's about. Yeah, I just came back from one. I just came back from a cruise in Australia that left out of Sydney, and it was a nine-night cruise on Royal Caribbean, and it went down to uh, Tasmania, and it went across southern Australia. We had about 250 other genealogists, mainly from Australia, and it's a neat concept that really Fisher is getting more and more popular in the genealogy field. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah. (laughs) Well, if if you look at it, it's like attending a genealogy conference or getting a week's long worth of education while you're also on vacation. Uh, You can bring other family members. They don't have to be into genealogy. And, And also, you don't miss out on the visits to the port cities because all of your lectures, all of your networking takes place while the boat is at sea. Wow, so you get the vacation benefit, the education benefit, and and the socializing side of it, too. Exactly. You 
know, and, and a lot of times with the crews, uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to sit there and play bingo all day or trivia. You might not be into sports. The trend, I think, in the industry is there are more and more theme types of cruises. If you look at Disney, I mean, they have their own cruise line. So there is a trend in the travel industry towards that. The cruises sometimes go to heritage locations. I did one three years ago with Legacy Family Tree that went from New York up to New England and eastern Canada. And we had a lot of people that had ancestry there. So they could get off in, in Halifax and do research at the cemetery or, or at the archives. We're talking um, about when, the Tories, the, the loyalists? Exactly right, yeah. And, and so I actually took a group of about 50 people into Boston at the New England Historic Genealogical Society for a day of research. But even if it isn't centered around where your ancestors lived, you get top-notch educators and lecturers that you would see at any genealogy conference. But the other thing is you get to spend one-on-one time with them very often. Because they're trapped on the boat with you. (laughs) Well, yes. Yeah, but there are some great ones that are coming up over the next few years. I know uh, the company that I traveled with in Australia is called Unlock the Pass. They're actually doing a Baltic cruise, uh, I believe in 2016, and they're doing a transatlantic crossing in November of 2015 out of Southampton to New York and then to Miami. Wow, so you can actually take the route that your ancestors took exactly. while that, learning that about it. going to be a migration theme. I mean, that's going to be the whole theme is migration. So some of these cruises right now, they're mapped out, they're planned. You may not be able to sign up yet. The speakers may not be all signed up, but there are some that are being planned. Legacy Family Tree also does one every year, and they have one in Japan. They're doing one in Japan out of Hong Kong. They're doing two different cruises this fall. So how long has this been going on? It's been going on actually for several years. I think one genealogy vendor... The Master Genealogists, they've been doing, they're on their 10th cruise now. Uh, I did a cruise with them of Alaska. You talk about a great cruise. Wow. (laughs) I mean, this is out of Seattle. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was seven nights. It was out of Seattle, and it was just unbelievable. The group was great. I hosted breakfast where we talked about technology and genealogy. But then I could go and do other things on the boat. I could go to Skagway and get off the boat and take the tour of Juneau or whatever. So as a speaker, it was also good for me as well. Now, when you go on there, you have to have your own laptop, I would assume. Well, keep in mind, on a cruise ship, Internet is still very expensive. I mean, it comes down to $35 an hour. Wow. Uh, Yeah, it's unbelievable. So what I was doing, here I am hanging off the side of the boat while we came into port with my iPhone, trying to catch up on my email, and very often, if you have access, that is what a lot of us did. We waited until we got into port. And as someone that speaks about technology and the Internet, as a speaker, it was hard for me to do some of my talks because I'm so used to going live out to the Internet. But you just plan for that. I have to say that it's also nice to disconnect Fisher every once in a while from the Internet and from Facebook and all that drama and social media. And a cruise is a nice way to do that. So what do you do if you're interested in going on a cruise? Well, search for genealogy cruise out on the Internet. Look at some of the itineraries that are being planned. Someone asked me, well, isn't it more expensive than just going through one of the cruise discounters? And I said, it's a little bit more, but you have to understand, they're paying the genealogy speakers. They're putting together, you should get a free cocktail party. You get, you know, all these events that are included. So the way that I've calculated, it's usually only about two or three hundred dollars more than the normal cruise price. Wow, and it can but go for think, over a week. Yeah, for over a week, even more than that. They did one last year through the Panama Canal from San Diego over to Fort Lauderdale, and that was almost two weeks. And that was with Megan Smolniak, who's a very well-known speaker. She was the lead speaker. And the other thing is, think about the networking opportunities. You always have people finding cousins on these boats. Really? Oh, I didn't realize that you were related, that we're working on the same surname. I mean, that always happens. I believe there's at least no more than six degrees of separation between two genealogists (laughs) uh, once you get them in a room together. But the opportunity is great. Just as genealogy has become addictive, I think these cruises have become a bit addictive to some people. Yeah, I would think. Uh, and, you know, and you pick the one that's right for you. If you've never been, Now, I had never been on a cruise before, Fisher, th- until three years ago, and now I'm hooked. 
but genealogy cruising, it's really becoming more and more popular. I, I think the hardest thing for me would be if I'm there and, I, and I'm listening to, to great experts on all kinds of different topics, maybe things I'd never considered before, and, and I'd be wanting to do it, but I don't have Internet access, I'd probably be about to explode. Yeah, well, actually, what a lot of the companies do, at least on Lock the Pass, uh, it was nice because they made sure there was sort of like what I call aftercare after the cruise. They made sure that you had access to all the handouts and the syllabus materials that you could download them. Surveys and feedback are very important. You know, how was the boat? How was the staff? How were the lectures? Because they're always looking to improve. So it's not one of those things where you get off the boat and say, okay, yeah, thanks a lot, and then you never hear from the group again. In fact, I have photos of my dinner mates from Australia, and uh, I stay in touch with them now via email. Even though we don't have any connection research, they're all into convict ancestors, which is real popular (laughs) in in, in Australia. Is that right? Uh, Yeah, oh yeah, it's a badge of honor now. It used to be, you know, you would be ashamed to have a convict. But now everyone wants to find their black sheep ancestors, which are convicts, which came over in First Fleet, I believe, in 1798. But I still stay in touch with a lot of my Aussie friends that I met on the cruise. So it's a great opportunity. I think there's an opportunity out there for somebody who wants to find their niche in the genealogy world to do nothing but black sheep research. (laughs) Exactly. Actually, Ron Ahrens does that. Ron Ahrens is uh, my go-to guy for Black Sheep Ancestor. He maintains lists of prison inmates, and he's also done research at the Sing Sing Prison in upstate New York. But no, Black Sheep Ancestors is where it's at. Well, and especially because, as somebody pointed out to me, they've left so many more records (laughs) because of what they've done. Exactly, yes. Well, it sounds like a great thing to do, Thomas. And if people want to find out more about genealogy cruises, what's the best way to go? best ways is just to go to and search for uh, the term genealogy cruise on Google. There are several companies. One is called unlockthepast.com. They're out of Australia, but they do international cruises. Legacyfamilytree.com. They have a cruise every year. The Master Genealogist is another group that does a cruise. And so that's a good way to start. He's Thomas McEntee, the founder of High Definition Genealogy. Thanks for the info, Tom. You're welcome. And coming up next, he's our preservation authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, delving into the mysteries of storing your data on Blu-rays. It's on the way on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Remember how fun it was to capture those special moments of your children's childhood on video and watch it back, knowing that you'd be able to have that memory forever. Or watching a home movie of your own childhood and seeing many of your loved ones who are now gone. If you haven't yet digitized those family treasures, you're at risk of losing all of them with each passing day. Time and elements slowly destroy videos and film, as well as rare old photos and audio recordings. Rescuing your memories is what TMCPlace.com has been doing for over 40 years. They can transfer all these disks and hard drives so you and your family can enjoy them digitally for generations to come and without damaging the originals. They provide free shipping both ways on most orders. They even offer GPS real-time tracking of your package so you can be confident that nothing can ever be lost in transit. Call toll-free 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your special project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. How's your family history research going? Are you stuck on a difficult line? Don't know how to start? Let the professionals at Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services help. Heritage Consulting has been providing professional research and consultation services since 1978. They can help you find your own personal family history for far less than you would expect by researching, collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the numerous historical documents your ancestors left in their lifetime. They'll then provide you with a professionally written report in book or electronic form that you and your family can enjoy for literally generations. Knowledge of your ancestors forges stronger ties within your family and helps children better appreciate who they are within the context of your family history. Call Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services right now. The call is free. Dial 1-877-537-2000. That's 1-877-537-2000. You'll speak directly to an expert genealogist. Find out more at Heritage Consulting com
And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here with our preservation authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. Welcome back, Tom. Good to be back. You know, i got to tell you, when we started this show, I never imagined that all these recommendations you're making could be so controversial. From, <laughs> exactly. from the idea that discs are going to be outdated to the best kind of disc to use for preservation. But you really, you stir up hornet's nests. I have. You've heard from more people than me. What do you have this time? Now, one thing that's really confusing to people is most machines, before they started disappearing, didn't have Blu-rays because Blu-ray was so new. They were so expensive. They didn't put them in uh, machines. But now there are so many different options out there. It's best to have an external one versus an internal one because then you can also use it on other pieces of equipment. You can be on your laptop, take your Blu-ray burner with it. You're working on anything else. You can take it home. You can take it to work. So why have all these expensive Blu-ray burners? And Sony and Panasonic are two of the leaders. They're two of the biggest players in the game. And they're the ones that are going together, as we mentioned last week, and are going to work on the summer of 2015, coming up with a one terabyte Blu-ray disc. Anybody can get all their stuff on a terabyte. I would think you could get everything from a lifetime on a terabyte. But nonetheless, Blu-ray, in my mind, when I hear that, I'm thinking movies on Saturday night. Exactly. And that's what most people are thinking, the exact same thing. But Blu-ray is an exceptional way to store your data. It's made out of a, a stronger polycarbonate. The dyes in it are so much better. It is truly a digital archive medium. Talk about the storing the hard drives themselves, because that's a whole different game, isn't it? Oh, it is, yeah. Switching to hard drives, there's two basic kinds of hard drives. There's the HDD, which is a hard drive disk, which most people know of, and then there's the SSD, which is a solid-state drive. The best kind are SSDs, which are solid-state, because a hard drive has a spinning platter. You have to read the box and see how fast your platter spins to know how fast it's going to be, if you're going to have to sit and watch that little colored You're beach talking ball. moving parts here, right? Exactly. And moving parts means things can break. And they go a lot slower. Yes. Absolutely. So with a solid-state hard drive, I had heard about them. When I first got mine, I bought a new MacBook Pro, and it had that on it. And when you push the button, you don't have your finger off the button, and it started. It's ready to go. It's like crazy fast. And the prices have come down on them so much. You Amazing. can get them for, what, 80, 80 90 bucks now oh, yeah. at the low end. Oh, yeah. Oh, under 100 bucks easy. And my only regret to my SSD, I didn't get a bigger one. But they are amazing because I've always used external drives for all my photos. But with the SSD, it accesses them so much faster. I can drop them on there, do all my editing, and when I'm done, clear it off and put some more photos on or whatever I'm doing. Just because something's on your internal drive doesn't mean it has to be there forever. Back it up onto your external hard drives when you don't need the speed, and then erase those off your SSD, put new stuff on there, and you will not believe how fast you can edit, even with big programs like Final Cuts Pro. It's just amazing. Also, Fish, you mentioned something about storage. You want to be really careful with your hard drives. They get gunk on them. Mm. And when you erase things off your hard drive, you're not really erasing it. You're erasing the address. The stuff is still there. So you want to get a good program, like Norton Utilities makes some good programs, that will optimize your hard drives. It'll take all the garbage out and move it away, and it will find what files are related, and it will reformat them back to where they're close to each other. So on a standard hard drive, you'll find things faster. It's not sitting there searching over your whole hard drive. So get a good program to optimize your hard drives. So I love this, because you're talking about now speed, better accessibility, greater reliability before the things finally die, which could be a long, long time, especially with solid state. Right, with all those things, and it's cheaper. All right, and coming up next, Tom has more for us. We're going to get back into the acronyms, the DPIs, the PPIs. What does all this mean? Why does it matter to you? Tom will tell you next, coming up on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. All right, 
right, welcome back. You have found us, Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. And remember, of course, you can always ask Tom questions at AskTom at TMCPlace.com, and you just might hear your question answered on the air. What do you have for us now, Tom? All these acronyms. You're going to get me confused again. I know you are. Please take notes. (laughs) All right, I'll write them down. Okay, we have PPI, which is pixels per inch, which refers to like a television or a monitor yep. because it's the little pixels. Then we have DPI, which is dots per inch, which is usually a laser printer, right. inkjet printer, thermal printers. And then also you have megapixels, which is when we're talking about cameras. Oh, boy. Okay. So it can get confusing, and people think a DPI versus a DPI is always the same. Well, that's, you said the same thing there. But they're not. Are all apples the same? There's Granny Smith, there's Washington State, there's all these different kinds of apples, okay. so it's the same thing. You have to be really, really careful. Pixels per inch is what you see on a monitor, but if you think that transfers straight into DPI, and you're like, say, 72 on your monitor, and then you print something at 72, you're going to go, why doesn't this look as good? In order to have DPI equivalent to PPI, you have to have a lot more DPI to equal your PPI. Oh, boy. Okay, so what you need to do is actually see what the pixel count is or the dots per inch and then find out what kind of heads the machine has. A good example is I have a brother laser printer we use in one of our stores, and it prints at 72 DPI, and it looks fine, and everything looks great. I can take a file and print on that, and it looks okay. I can take that same 72 DPI file and print on my great big MUTO printer, which I make banner signs, decals. No comparison. It's photographic quality on my MUTO because of the way it lays down the dots per inch. So don't think every 200 DPI or every 72 DPI is the same. Huh. The way they lay it down, the print head technology is different on all those things. And if you want to get into more information, you can look at stuff on Wikipedia. There's a lot of places on Google that you can search. But you have to be really, really careful. We have people come in the store all the time and says, hey, you know, I need this at 72 DPI. And I say, well, what exactly are you going to be doing? If you're doing a little 5 by 7 or a billboard, they're two totally different things. Your pixels per inch, your dots per inch, your megapixels are different based on what you need. Like we've talked before, if you're going to move a little bit of dirt and you can move it in some buckets in your station wagon, go for it. Don't go buy a you know Ram 350 to move a couple you know <laughs> buckets of dirt. It's a good comparison. And it comes back to, again, we've had people calling me and say, hey, I listen to your radio show, but I still don't understand. My old film, my old 8 millimeter film from the 30s and 40s, why do I need to do it in high definition? It is what it is. Again, let me give you an example. If you go into a machine shop, you see this big roll of steel. Well, a big roll of steel is a big roll of steel. You turn that into paper clips, and it's a buck per hundred. Sure. You turn that into a surgical scalpel, and it's one per probably thousands of dollars. So it's how you do it. So when we shoot your old 8 millimeter films that are fading, when we scan them at a real high definition, we can pull more information out than you can see by just projecting that on a screen. So as I mentioned before, we had some old film I found of my father's that never got transferred because it was so dark you couldn't even see it in the projector. When we transferred it in high definition, it was grainy. However, you could see faces and people, and you knew who they were, and there were some very choice stuff that never would have got transferred if I wouldn't have known that. And you could also take that and make those into photographs, and then because of the better detail, you could Photoshop out a lot of the imperfections, could you not? Exactly. Exactly. That's one of the greatest things about if you can afford it to upgrade your film transfer to high definition and get the JPEGs. I have found so many photos on my old film that my dad shot that are priceless to me. I would give up anything for them. And this technology wasn't here two years ago, and it's just it's blessing our lives. And it's constant that we see this improvement going on all the time. I'm glad we keep up with you, Tom. Absolutely. All right, thanks for joining us. And once again, if you have a question for Tom, you can ask Tom at tmcplace.com, and hopefully we'll answer your question on the show. Thanks for joining us this week. It's been great talking to you. We'll see you again next week on Extreme Genes Family History Radio. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 